It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the movies of December 30th, 2005. Also, my 2005 leftover show. This is basically the last weekend of 2005. So, um, we have a couple new releases for this particular weekend. One from Woody Allen, one starring Pierce Brosnan and Ray Kinnear. And then we have all of these movies that are leftovers from this year. Let me get the cheat there. There we go. And most of them are pretty much direct-to-video movies, but, um... A lot of Disney ones, a lot of Fo some Fox ones, some Showtime ones, so we'll de we'll delve into this in just a little bit here. But let's get to the two new releases of the weekend first. Uh, we'll start off with the biggest new releases of the bunch, that is Woody Allen's Match Point. So of all of Woody Allen's movies that he was making around this time, this was the one that felt the most freshest and the most different one from ones that he had made beforehand. This was the movie that really entered him into a brand new era that we will eventually see from him. We were thought, we, at least we thought we were going to see from him. But um, he had a couple movies after this that were kind of similar to this, but none could really be as good as this particular film, because this film was really... This film really took a lot of people by surprise that it came from Woody Allen. And in it, you have Jonathan Reese Myers, who's a former professional tennis player who marries into a wealthy family, but his social position is threatened by his affair with his brother-in-law's girlfriend, played by Scarlett Johansson. It deals with themes of mortality and greed, explores the roles of lust, money, and luck in life, and as many com people compared it to one of Allen's earlier films, Crimes and Misdemeanors. And it's actually one of the first movies that Woody Allen made outside of New York City. He actually filmed this in London because he, didn't, he couldn't find any financial support in New York City to work this on. So he assembled a cast and crew that was mostly from the UK. He rewrote the script and basically said it in English. And it works to the film's favor because it's a really good movie. It's a very intense psychological thriller. It's something very different that we haven't seen from Woody Allen in a long, long time. I think the last one that even came close to being something like this was the film that he made after Andy Hall, which was interior. Was it Interiors? or It was something like that. I, I, need, to I need to check just to make sure. I was right, it was Interiors. I was thinking of the Talia Shire 80s movie, uh, Windows, where she, where, you know, she's attacked by some guy, some guy, it was like a les it was like a lesbian thriller, that's what I, that's what I was thinking of the t title was, but no, it was called Interiors. It's a much more darker movie, it's not really much of a comedy in general. In fact, Woody Allen's not even in this movie at all, I mean, this is a movie that is strictly a cast that includes people like Brian Cox, Matthew Good, you know, uh, Jonathan Reese Myers, as I said, Emily Mortimer, Scarlett Johansson's the only one in this movie, that is not does not have a UK a London accent in this movie, and it's just it just feels like a very very different movie than what we used to seeing from a guy like Woody Allen, and it's refreshing, it's very sadistic, it's very th tense all the way through. Scarlett Johansson, Jesus, like lost the translation. If you didn't think she was she was a really good, if, 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 uh, I've lost my train of thought. I'm thinking about Scarlett Johansson too much, but if you didn't think that the opening of Lost in Translation was her or sexiest, this movie takes the cake, man. I mean, this is a movie that is just, like, this is prime Scarlett Johansson. This is like when people realize that, oh my God, this woman is beautiful. And she's a great actress, too. Win-win. It's a double win on everyone's part. And, um, yeah, I mean... Really, there's not much more I can say about this movie that hasn't already been said. It's a really good thriller. It feels very different from what we're used to seeing from Woody Allen. It has a great cast to work with here. It keeps you on the edge of your seat, wondering how it's going to transpire. And it's just a fun... It's not even a fun film. It's a really, really good movie. I mean, it's fun if you think affairs are fun in general, which there might be some people that think that's the case, but it's a really good movie. I recommend it a lot. Definitely one of the best movies of the year, no question about it. Match point. So let's go ahead and move on to kind of an underrated movie with Pierce Brosnan in it called The Matador. No, but um, in this movie, you have a chance encounter between a traveling salesman played by Greg Kinnear and a lonely hitman played by Brosnan, who trigger a strangely profound relationship which provokes each to act in ways they never would have imagined possible. Fate steps in to form a friendship between the two men from irreconcilable worlds that will alternate the lives of both forever. And uh, in addition to Greg Kinnear, you have Hope Davis, Philip Baker Hall, Dylan Baker, Adam Scott's also in the movie as well. And it was a movie that surprisingly does kind of work. I mean, the marketing was kind of all over the place, but when you watch the film, it's a very odd movie. It's a film that kind of has, a, it reminded me a lot of The Ice Harvest a little bit, a movie I talked about before, which I think is a better movie in general. But this movie, I think, really does work very well on a number of different levels, mostly because of what the cast and crew bring bring to the table in this. Brosnan's great in the movie. Great Kinnear is really good. 
uh, the storyline that they have, the, the guys have to go through here is very well done. It's just a really, really enjoyable movie. A movie that shows what these two guys are very ca much capable of. And keep in mind, this was also supposed to be originally a director video release. The director even said he had actually he had written it for a video release because he thought nobody in Hollywood was going to make it. But luckily, the Weinstein Company had just started up, and they were looking for movies to try to get their name out there. And lo and behold, this is the movie that this is a movie that sold to them and. It kind of worked out in their favor in the long run. It's a pretty good movie. It's one I definitely recommend checking out if you haven't seen it. The Matador, a really, really underrated little gem. So now let's go ahead and get into the leftovers of the year. And again, this paper will not stay st stay up. So let's go ahead and get right to it. And we'll start off with the first release I have on here, and that is Mulan 2. Oh, no. Don't let that happy little trailer fool you on any way, shape, or form. This movie has takes takes some of those beloved characters and just completely obliterates anything that made them likable in the first movie. Especially Mushu, because good lord. Uh, Mulan 2, the first of many, many direct video sequels from Disney that came out in 2005. And um, in the movie, you have Fa Mulan getting the surprise of her young life when her love, Captain, now General Li Shang, as for a hand in marriage. Between the two can live there happily ever after. The, the Emperor assigns them to a special mission to escort three princesses to Qui-Gon, China, and Mushu is determined to dream in a wedge between the couple after he learns that he will lose his guardian job if Mulan marries into the Li family. After the princesses unexpectedly fall in love with the Gang of Three, of course, from the pr previous film, Mulan decides to help them escape the fate of marrying men they don't love. Contradicting the Emperor's orders and forcing him to put Mulan's relationship with Chang into question, they're attacked by Mongolians, and the fate of China hangs in the balance. Yeah. So the first Mulan movie was made with the same heart and intentions that Disney puts into their animated classic, which is admittedly probably one of the overall weaker movies in the 90s Disney Renaissance, but it's still a good movie to it. That has a lot of heart and charm to it. This is about as typical and pointless as your bad sequel is going to get, pretty much on all fronts on it. From the lackluster animation that can be downright silly in many parts to turning Mushu into the biggest dick bag in the world in this movie. It's bad enough that Eddie Murphy can't come back to play Mushu, so we get kind of a half-assed Mushu impersonation, but the fact that his only purpose in this movie is to split Mulan and Li Shang up so he won't lose his guardian job, it's not only lazy, but it makes Mushu into a straight-up dick bag. Like, he, he's the real bad guy in this movie. He'd be even more threatening than the actual villains are in this movie, which... By the way, they don't even show up in this movie at all, no. Because interested in Mulan actually fighting bad guys and kicking butt like she did in the last movie, what's her big mission in this? Take these three daughters to meet their fiancés and turn it into a bad road movie because that's all this really is, a really bad road movie. And the worst part about it is, is that they're arranged to be married to these three Chinese princesses so that an alliance can be formed by the kingdom of Qui-Gon so they can help stop the Mongolians. And guess what? Remember the supporting characters from the last movie? The princesses all fall for them instead. So basically, they're giving up China for true love. Yeah. It's nice that you meet your special someone, ladies, but uh, you just fuck China up in the ass in the process, and the movie makes it seem like it's the right decision to do at the end, and no, no it isn't. The whole point of this is that you're doing this to save China. You are literally putting millions of lives on the line because your heart is telling you to go down another path, and it's just like, go fuck yourself, man. Like, this movie has some of the most fucked up logic I've ever seen in my life, and, you know, how's that supposed to work? You know, Mushu's bad in this, Mulan's bad in this, the animation in, the, in this is bad, the songs are bad, the story, just... Everything about this movie is so horribly put together. Even for a direct -to video movie, this is pathetic what they put together here. And, you know, I think I've used enough F-bombs to put my point together, and this is... Bottom line here is this movie is terrible. This is an absolutely horrible, horrible movie. Avoid this one like the plague, because good lord, they completely took everything that made the first Mulan movie so so special and just drained it, flushed it down the toilet. I would rather watch the 2020 live action remake again than this pile of garbage. And again, this is a, that's how bad this movie is. So um, we'll we'll take a step into some more Disney movies in a little bit here, direct to video movies because our next one is a Disney movie, but it's a Disney Channel original movie, Kim Possible movie, so the drama. <clears throat> I believe that uh, this is actually the second Disney Channel original animated movie. The first one was Kim Possible A Stitch in Time. If I had my glasses right now, I could pull off the full nerd effect, but uh, I do actually have reading glasses, but um, I haven't used them in years, so I have no idea where the hell they are in my house. But um, yeah, 
uh, this is actually the second Disney Channel original animated movie after A Sitch in Time, but this is the one that marks the end of the Kim Possible series as a whole. This was supposed to be originally the series finale before they eventually bought it back for another season. And uh, in, the fin in this movie, which is set up as the final episode, as they're on their next adventure mission, Kim and Rom reflect on their own lives and everything that they have been through together. They both need to figure out what is next in their own lives and how it will all affect their friendships and relationships. And, uh, like I said, it's a movie that literally sets itself up as the final episode as a whole, but kind of unlike the previous Kim Possible movie, which was more comedic in, in the adventure that it was going on, this one does take itself more seriously. Like, that title of So the Drama takes another level in this, because this is much more serious of a movie than you could have possibly imagined it. You still get some comedy here and there, but this is one where I really do feel like they did put a lot more effort into it to make it seem like this is about as close to a theatrical movie as you're possibly going to get. It's a much bigger movie in terms of scope, scale, epicness, and just how everything is going to go out, turn out in the end. And it makes for a really enter entertaining movie that if you were a fan of Kim Possible back in the day like I was, you probably get a ver you do get a very satisfactory series finale, or what was supposed to be a series finale before the show eventually was brought back for another season. But, um, yeah, this is a really good movie. If you love the original Kim Possible series... And you and you want to see how the what a proper finale to this could be like? You're gonna get it from this movie here because it definitely delivers on what was supposed to be the final episode. But as I said, it was later brought back. But um, for what they were giving you here, it works very well. It's a really good movie. Uh, if you like Kim Possible, this is a very serviceable finale. And uh, not much more to say about that one. Kim Possible movie, so the drama. So let's go ahead and move on to the next movie we have here, and that is We for Madness, the movie musical. Yeah, you know how The Producers was seen as a mostly mixed bag musical that came out in December of 2005? Well, months before that, we had a movie musical here based off of a, a classic film that probably should have just stayed as a musical. Because let me tell you something, this is pretty bad. I mean, this is a movie that I feel like was probably intending to be so much more than what they expected it to be. But man... This is a rough, rough movie to sit through. This is, of course, based off the, the classic 1936 public domain exploitation film of the same name, but this is actually based off of a 1998 musical of the same name with a, with a lot of the same people who made that bringing it into, into the forefront in this movie. And a cast that includes Kristen Bell, Nev Campbell, Alan Cumming, Anna Gasteyer, John Kayser, and Steven Weber. Just a really, a really memorable cast in general, but unfortunately they're not really given a whole lot to do in this movie except just be... Just be over the top, and man, does it not work in this film's favor. It tells the tale of the Harper affair, in which young Jimmy Harper finds his life of promise turned into a life of debauchery and murder, thanks to the new drug menace marijuana. Along with the way he receive, along the way he receives help from his girlfriend Mary and Jesus himself, but always finds himself in the arms of the Reefer Man and the rest of the denizens know of the Reefer Den. See, the problem with this movie is, is that the original Reefer Madness is one of the most legendary public domain. Uh, over the is guilty pleasure movies of all time because it's a movie that is notoriously bad for it's the de very definition of a so bad it's good type of movie. When you try to remake a movie like that in today's world with a film like this, oh boy, like it really it struggles to find an identity to its to itself. This movie gets way too more over the top. It's made for a modern setting, so that means there's got to be more sex involved here. There's got to be more drugs. There's got to be more people literally. There's people that they're literally trying to recapture the same look and feel of the original movie, and boy, does that not hold up in 2005. I mean, this this was a rough watch to sit through, and I love a lot of the people that are involved in this movie, but oh my god, this movie is rough. Like this, If the original movie is a so bad it's a good type of movie, this is a movie that's so bad it's bad. Like This is easily the worst musical that came out in 2005, and yeah, we had stuff like Rent, we had the producers, but you know what? This one takes the cake. And this was just, this was just a, a mess to sit through. I mean, I, I heard about this movie for the longest time, and I watched it in the last couple months to get ready for this. But man, it was definitely not worth it. I will tell you that this was, um, this was pretty rough. This was a really, really rough sit down to to go through. And uh, yeah, not much more to say about this one. But um, yeah, it's pretty bad. So with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie here. Uh, Fox getting into the director video market this year with a couple of movies. Uh, one of the, the the most notable one of them being The Sandlot Two.
Speaking of movies that are trying to capture the magic of their predecessors and failing miserably, The Sandlot 2. In the 12 years since the first movie, a new group of kids has moved into The Sandlot. Uh, you have um, David Durango, Max McKing, Saul, his stepbrother Sammy Fingers, Tarkel, Scotty's younger brother Johnny Smalls, and a surprise from The Sandlot 2, a girl in the group, Haley Goodfairy or Samantha Burton. Uh, when Johnny mistakenly sends a model rocket over the junk fence in the Great Fear's yard, the gang must retrieve her. Even with the help of the retriever, a kid who steals dog tags to find the Great Fear's a challenge. Yes, and complete with another psychotic name-calling scene with Mac and Mooley, Captain Singleton, and of course with James Earl Jones as Mr. Myrtle. James Earl Jones is the only person that comes back in this movie. And talk about a film that is literally trying to recapture the magic of the original film and failing miserably. This is a film that is just so... The bottom, def the bottom line of a bad direct-to-DVD sequel that's not there to do anything to expand on the story from the first movie. This is just a movie that's made to literally rehash the same movie again, do it for a modern audience, and hopefully you're, stu hopefully you're stupid enough to go along for the ride. And man, I mean, I didn't buy into it. I, f I got this as part of a, like a triple feature set with the original film and the, the third film in the series, which we'll eventually delve into, The Sandlot Heading Home, which also is bad, but this... Yeah, this is bad. This is a really, really bad movie. Like, this is a really... This is just nothing but a retread of the original Sandlot movie. And it's just like... Like, do something different with it. I mean, how about a Sandlot sequel that actually has all the kids grown up? You know, let's have a story about the kids all grown up. Maybe the dog is still alive at this point. Maybe he's old, and maybe there's a relationship that they have with it. The dog in this, the dog from the last movie. The dog is one of the more memorable things about the original Sandlot, too. But, um... No, they just try to rehash everything that made the first movie so special and then put it into this movie, and it just doesn't work. It's a me really, really bad direct-to-DVD sequel, but not the last bad direct-to-DVD sequel to come from 20th Century Fox, because as I said, they would start the trend of doing what Disney did in the past and saying, we're going to make our own sequels to movies here. I mean, I am, you know, we are owned, but we are run by Tom Rothman, who clearly has a, a bright future for 20th Century Fox going forward, as the next couple of years will definitely show. Not really, but um, not much more to say about this one. The Sandlot 2. So um, so let's go ahead and get back to some Disney movies. Let's get back to some Disney direct-to-video sequels. Uh, starting with Tarzan 2. I mean, it's better than Tarzan and Jane. I guess I'll give it that. So uh, in this movie, set back when Tarzan was just a boy, this is the story of Tarzan's journey to self-discovery. When Tarzan begins to see that he is not like the other gorillas, his mother Kala, once again played by Glenn Close, assures him that his slight differences only make him stronger. But when he discovers that when these differences put Kala in danger, he decides everyone will be better off without him and runs away. He then finds himself in a dark, desolate land called Dark Mountain, where he meets a new friend who helps him discover that even though he does not possess the talents of an ape, he has his own unique set of jungle skills that make him even more amazing than any other creature so that he can finally see who he truly is, that ape being played by George Carlin. And uh, let's set the record straight first here. This is not, this is a prequel, not a sequel. So the movie kind of, so once again, they're kind of telling you something that's not true on this front. It's not, it's not really a Tarzan 2. It's more like a Tarzan one and a half, if you will. So once again, false advertising on Disney's part. But as far as the film itself goes, it's actually not that bad. I mean, I would even dare go as far as to say, it's probably one of the more enjoyable direct-to-video movies they've done. It's not a classic by any means necessary, but it is an interesting and fun little continuation with these younger characters that I thought could have been more detailed in the original theatrical release. And nothing about this movie one stands out in terms of a story, but from an animation perspective, it does have much nicer animation than you could have asked for in a direct-to-video sequel. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Bambi 2 a little bit, kind of like a mid -core, like a movie that takes place in between certain events of Tarzan. Like, this would take place right after, you know, he he realizes that he's not one of the apes and has to realize who he really is. Like, this is a really fun film. It's a great, it's got a lot of good voice actors in here. George Carlin doing a very good job in this. He's very funny. And he does give a v occasionally very charming performance in this. This is actually one of his last movies that he did before his death, the other one being Cars, and a couple other ones as well. But this is not a classic by any means necessary. It's okay, but nothing incredible. But the animation really works very well. The voice acting is nicely done. It's a harmless but enjoyable sequel, a prequel, if you will, to a good Disney film. Take it for what it is, and I think you can enjoy it for what it is. So. That's Tarzan 2, so let's go ahead and move on to the next one we have here, and that is another Disney Channel original animated movie released in 2005, The Proud Family Movie. A movie that is so big, 
it's completely retconned in the in the recent Proud Family series. Yes, no joke. In the Proud Family, Louder and Prouder, they literally retcon this entire movie and make it a dream. So none of this even happens in real life. But um, before this was completely retconned, you have the story of Penny, once again played by Kyla Pratt, whose relationship with her father hasn't exactly been a close one. Her father, of course, being Tommy Davidson. Uh, Penny is about to turn 16, and she is determined to have the best birthday ever. She and her friends audition to become backup dancers for this rapper, 15 Cent, who's the cousin of Sticky Webb. 15 Cent begins to develop romantic feelings for Penny as she recuperates her, her feelings to her. The two share a kiss, causing an infuriated Oscar to look on. Oscar grounds Penny and doesn't allow her to have a bir birthday, causing Penny to furiously disown Oscar for treating her like a child and for being her father. Trudy tries to get Penny and Oscar to make peace by taking them on a tropical vacation, which apparently a lot of these Disney Channel movies back then... That's what That was their idea of a movie. Let's go on a tropic adventure because, hey, it's a movie, so we're going to take it on a bigger level than the series beforehand. But Penny doesn't seem to be enjoying the trip as she befriends Cashew, a sympathetic peanut clone of Dr. Carver, played by Arsenio Hall. However, another plot begins to unravel for Penny when she uncovers Dr. Carver's true motives, and she learns that the family she went home with isn't actually her family, but clone versions of themselves. Penny enlists the help of her friends to save her real family from Dr. Carver, this movie is fucking nuts, man. Like, like quite literally. This is one of the most chaotic movies I have ever seen in my entire life. It's just like... But then again, that probably makes it more sense for the Proud Family Louder and Prouder to retcon this as a dream. Because, good lord, the stuff they pull in this movie is just so insane and so over the top. Like, it makes sense why this was probably retconned into a dream. Because everything about this movie feels like a really effed up nightmare. Like, this is something that probably Dumbo would have seen... If is in the in the pink elephant sequence from that from the original Dumbo movie, I mean this is how crazy the movie gets here. I don't know what they were on when they were doing this, but they were apparently having fun with it. And if you go along on that front, I think you can enjoy this movie for what it is. I mean, it's a very chaotic movie. It's a very very chaotic movie that just feels so out of place with the original Proud Family series, but. Now that I think about it, maybe it is maybe it is probably better that the the reboot actually did retcon this as a dream because how would the hell you explain this to, thing to happen in real life in general? So and again, would that make the Lilo and Stitch crossover a retcon too? Probably. I mean, I guess I get. I mean, I'm guessing that's what probably would happen, but um, I don't know. But um, overall, I really enjoyed this one a lot, though. It is very chaotic, over the top, but fun. Speaking of Lilo and Stitch, what a segue. Let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, Lilo and Stitch 2. Stitch has a glitch. You know, it's interesting how this one in particular does feel like more of a sequel to the original Lilo and Stitch in terms of the quality of animation because it was originally intended for a theatrical release, but I guess they decided, you know, we don't know if this is going to be successful enough to put it in theaters, so just put it out on DVD. But um, in this movie, it takes place between the original Lilo and Stitch series, and, uh, the movie, and the Lilo and Stitch series. Actually, between Lilo and Stitch and Stitch the movie, where you find the rowdy extraterrestrial Stitch, once again played by Chris Sanders, getting used to life with his new Ohana. However, a malfunction in the ultimate creation of Dr. Jumbo soon emerges, which reinstates his destructive programming and threatens to both ruin his relationship with Lilo, who's played here by Dakota Fanning, very different from the times when debate chase plays her. I don't know why they replaced her voice, but, and to short him out for good. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good movie. It's a film that really is well done on a lot of different levels. I mean, it's a surprisingly well-made sequel that's just as good as its theatrical predecessor, mostly because the movie works because the chemistry that both the main stars attribute together, and it still works very well, and the film's way of bringing up family and friendship is nicely executed, much like in the first film. It's a really good movie. It's one that, yeah, it probably should have gone to theaters. I could have easily seen this one making a ton of money at the box office because Lilo and Stitch was such a was that one little gem in a dark era for Disney during the early part of the 2000s. And um, you just like seeing these characters. I mean, these are what, these are incredible characters that you really do grow attached to. There's a reason why Stitch is my favorite Disney character. I mean, he's he's somebody that is universally appealing to everybody. As I, I've said this before, like. You know, for the guys, he's very destructive. He's very chaotic. He has a he's like he's like very lazy in general. And for the ladies, like he's so he's so cute. He's charming. Like it's like he he fits all different kinds of generations. Like you can find a lot to admire about this character in general. And that's what I really like about him so much. I think he is a a very fun character to watch. And you know, it helps that you have a great voice in Chris Sanders to bring that character to life in general. It's a really good movie. It's a well-made sequel, a well-put-together sequel that's just as good as the original film is. 
this probably would have worked as a theatrical release if they really put it out in theaters. And, um, yeah, I really like it a lot. So, Leland Stitch 2, Stitch has a glitch. So, let's move on to the next film we have here, and that is Roman Polanski's version of Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist. It's literally Oliver Twist. I mean, there's not really much more to say about the story in general. Orphan Oliver Twist is sent from the orphanage to a workhouse in the 19th century. Uh, where the children are mistreated and barely fed. He's moved to the house of an undertaker, but after an unfair, severe spank, he starts a seven-day runaway to London. He rides exhausted and starving, and soon welcomed into a gang of pickpocketers led by the old crook Fagin. When he's mistakenly taken as a thief, the wealthy victim, Mr. Growlow, brings Oliver into his home and shelters him, but Fagin and the dangerous Bill Sykes decides to kidnap Oliver to burglarize his Mr. Brownlow's fancy home. It's literally, like I said, it's literally the same plot as every other version of Oliver Twist. In fact, Oliver and Company, the Disney version, has very much the same story in general. And I think that's a better film in general here. Not to say that this movie is bad by any means necessary, but it's just nothing that different or that amazing in general compared to other versions of the story. They don't really do anything that new or different with it, except let's make it a live-action movie, and let's not make it with animals like we did with Oliver and Company. That's pretty much what the movie is in general. It's not. It's a. It's not a bad movie in any means, any way, shape, or form. But it's just. It's just not an engaging film in general. There's nothing really about it that makes it stand out compared to other versions of the story. I don't know. To me, it was one that I saw. I was just kind of like, yeah. Nothing really that different compared to other versions that I've seen. I'd rather watch Oliver and Company again than watch this one again, honestly. But it's not a bad movie. Just one that's not really all that memorable. So with that said, let us go ahead and move on to our next movie, and that is The Batman vs. Dracula. And hey, Batman goes up against Dracula. How the hell can you not be excited for that? Well, I've got some bad news for you. This is not the Batman of Batman the Animated Series going up against Dracula. No, 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 no. This is the Batman of... Well, the Batman going up against Dracula. And for those of you who don't remember the Batman, it was basically... A young Bruce Wayne, his third year of trying to establish himself as Batman, protector of Gotham City, living in Gotham, a metropolis where shadows run long and deep beneath elevated rain tracks, train tracks. Uh, the young, the younger Batman will confront each of his familiar foes for the first time. So, pretty much, Batman begins before Batman Begins came out, and while it never reached the levels set by the animated series, which that show will never be able to be top, no matter how hard they try to. I mean, I like Batman: Cape Crusader a lot, but. Nothing tops the original show. This was a series that did get off very slow, but got better as the seasons went on. It also helps that you got a really good voice actor in Reno Romano, who really does a great job playing uh, this young Bruce Wayne in general and making him his own character. This is the lone feature outing for the for that character, the Batman vs. Dracula, where Gotham City is not only terrorized by recent escapees Joker and Penguin, played by Kevin Michael Richardson and Tom Kenny, but by the original Creature of the Night, Dracula. Can Batman stop the ruthless vampire before he turns everyone into the city, including the Cape Crusader, Joker, and Penguin into his mindless minions? And this is not the first time these two have met up. There's been many comic books where they've met up, met up before. There's actually been movies where Batman fought Dracula. However, those ones were not authorized by DC Comics. But this is the first time in animated form where you have the two coming together to duke it out. And for the most part, it's rewarding as you get to see the Dark Knight and the Prince of Darkness go at it. I mean... The animation is good, but nothing that really stands out compared to the television series in general. The story works okay. I think the action sequences can be between Batman and Dracula can work nicely well. The way Dracula is able to walk around the sunlight, though, is definitely pretty weak. And even the final blow to how Dracula is defeated is kind of pretty lame. I mean, you expect much more for a battle between the Batman and Dracula to end that way. It's hard to make Dracula seem lame, but by doing that, the creators of the movie certainly don't... Re really seem like they were giving a crap of what they were trying to do here. There's a great hook to this movie. The fight itself is definitely worth it, but you have to sit through some pretty lame voiceover works. Like, as much as I love Kevin Michael Richardson and Tom Kenny, I don't think they're the best Joker or Penguin yet. And they're really not... They, the animation doesn't help in that much either. But I think Romano's Batman and Peter Stromer's Dracula... Why did I flip you guys off? I don't know why I was doing that. Well, that was not intentional. I just... I don't know why my finger was doing that, but... um. Anyway, like I was saying before that, still Romano's Batman and Peter Stromare's Dracula are great, and the story works well enough overall. It's just a mixed bag movie. Not a particularly good movie, but not one that I would say is one of the worst DC animated films I've ever seen. It's just kind of in the middle. I give it a pass because you really expect a lot more for a movie where Batman fights Dracula, and while the action can be good at times, it's not enough for me to fully recommend the movie. So, overall, eh, mixed opinion on that one. 
So uh, let's go ahead and move on to our last film that we have here, and that is Kronk's New Groove. There is also an eye and shit, and yeah, this movie is pretty shit. I mean, a movie where the breakout star of The Emperor's New Groove, Patrick Warburton's Kronk, should be much more interesting and much more engaging than anything in this particular movie. So in Kronk's New Groove, the storyline of this movie is simply this. Kronk desperately wants to try to find ways to impress his dad, played by John Mahoney, who he can never please. But when things go wrong, Kronk kinks into comical gear and discovers the true riches in life are his friends and being true to your groove. That's it. That's literally the plot of the movie. The Emperor's New Groove felt like a funny and overall enjoyable film, but this just feels like a lifeless, pointless movie compared to the first film. I mean, it's not Mulan too bad, but it might as well be Mulan too bad. The other overall stories they tell in this, it really does feel like an Atlantis 2 or a Tarzan and Jane, where they took an unaired pilot for a planned television series and advertised it as a movie. Which is funny, because there was actually a television series that came out around that time that was actually a whole lot better than this. I'll delve into that in just a second, but the humor in here is a major step down compared to the original film. You know, the original film had the Looney Tunes S Bing Bang style humor, and they never have any good payoffs to any of the jokes in this movie. I mean, really, what's funny about Yzma returning to her old form but just giving her a tail instead of just having her be a cat like she was at the end of the original film? Even the voice actors in here aren't wasted here. And you've got most of the main cast back in this movie. You got David Spade. John Goodman, Patrick Warburton, Eartha Kitt, you know, they add John Mahoney and Tracy Ullman to the cast, and they have nothing to do except pad out a 72-minute movie to sell the kids. Like, David Spade in particular is completely pointless here as Cusco, because he's basically just in the film to say, hey, I'm in the movie too, bye, that's pretty much all he does in here, and... Like I said, if you want a better continuation of the story of The Emperor's New Groove, just watch The Emperor's New School, which was the spin-off TV series that came out around this time that is so much better. It's set up entirely in a different continuity in the Crocs New Groove and actually realizes that, hey, the original film was funny, so let's take a lot of what made that first film fun and put it in this television series. And it's a much more enjoyable show than anything that came out of this movie. This is the typical example of a bad Disney-directed video sequel. Pointless, lifeless, not anywhere close to the original film. That's greatness. And this is definitely one you want to skip on. It's a major disappointment considering that the movie is based off one of the most memorable characters from the mo the most memorable character from The Emperor's New Groove. And this is the best they could do with it. Just, just shameful. Shameful indeed. And thus, we have officially completed 2005, my 16th year on the planet Earth. We begin my 17th year on this planet. Uh, I'm, like an, I'm sounding like an alien here. We start that on the next episode with the first three movies of 2006, including Eli, Mur Eli Roth's breakout hit, Hostel. We have the cult comedy classic, Grandma's Boy. And uh, Uwe Boll is back with another bad video game adaptation, Blood Rain. So we'll take a look at those three movies on the next episode. But until then... Thank you all so much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and notification button. We post videos here every day, and uh, until the next time I see you, we enter 2006 next time. So thanks for watching, I'll see you next time. Until then, as always, I'm off, and take care.